So I'm delighted that Matt Lavin has come to be our speaker today. I've known Matt since I had my first job at the University of Texas at Austin, and he was one of the cohort of an extremely talented group of students, the kind of cohort that keeps each other motivated and going on. Um, so I've um, been following his career and staying in touch with him and his family ever since. And when uh, this would be hearing some of his stuff, uh, I think you guys would be interested in. Um, here's his bio he sent me. Matt was born and raised as a Forest Service brat in Southern Idaho and Western Wyoming. Formerly educated at University of Nevada, Reno, University of Texas, Austin, and Cornell University, but received some of his most influential education studying the plant diversity of the sagebrush steppe in the Idaho National Laboratory during the summers of 2009, 2011, and sporadically since. Matt has been a faculty member of the Plant Sciences Department at Montana State University, Bozeman, where among other duties, he takes it upon himself during his spare time to study the plant diversity of the sagebrush steppe throughout Western North America. He says, I think that says it all. Well, that's not true. <laughs> I went to your website as well. And, you know, because I know, um, you know, met him at Texas for working on the um, phylogeny of Fabaceae. And so that's one of his expertise. And actually, he works on diversity and biogeography of legumes and graminoids. Um, he also likes highly seasonal environments with the sagebrush steppe as one example, but tro dry tropical forests is another one. Um, and he uses community phylogenetic approaches to understand how patterns of alpha and beta phylogenetic diversity are shaped by climate disturbance and other abiotic and biotic variables. Okay, mostly that's not what you're talking about. <laughs> but it's nice having people that have this breadth of knowledge. Um, I also noticed that apparently you got the Stebbins Award in 2017 and New York Botanical Gardens Henry Allen Gleason Award in 1993. So those are pretty cool. Um, but he's also just a fun person to have around. I'm delighted to be here and uh, that he's willing to come and visit us here in Boise. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Very kind words. I mean, we do go back a long ways. <laughs> And uh, Barbara and I, and I'm sure many of you in this audience, love to do what Clyde Aspabig, an artist in Montana, refers to as land snorkeling, where you just sort of wander <laughs> through country like this, and you just look at the plants, and then sometimes you get down on your knees or down on your belly to photograph or collect or do whatever it is to enjoy and savor the landscape and the plant diversity on it, right? And so one of my favorite places to do that is the sagebrush step of Western North America. And this is a Lamar Valley in the northeast corner of Yellowstone Park. And really fundamentally, from a big ecological perspective, it's not too different from the Idaho National Lab sagebrush step. It's higher elevation, but other than that, there's a lot of commonalities. And, and what I wanna make sure that when I say sagebrush step, I'm not just talking about sagebrush species, I'm talking about the intervening grasses or and grass-like plants, which collectively are referred to as graminoids, and then also the forbs that grow with these shrubs. And forbs are the herbaceous plants that are not graminoids. Okay, so those, those are big functional classes. I'd like to. You got shrub diversity and a good and a and sagebrush step and good ecological condition. You've got shrub diversity. You've got graminoid diversity, and you've got forb diversity. Okay, those are critical components. You can have that without actually having species of sagebrush and still call it sagebrush step. And then you see a road cutting through there off to the, to the left there, upper left, that's highway, US Highway 212 that's maintained as a federal highway. It's the one that goes up over the Beartooth Plateau and heads out Eastern Montana into the Dakotas ultimately. And the National Park Service maintains that road as if it's a conduit or quarter to invasive plant establishment and spread. So as a consequence, that road is sprayed and you get cheatgrass where they spray it. And then when they see the cheatgrass a year later, they'll spray it more and get more stuff. And what I'm trying to argue tonight is that uh, if, they if the Park Service left this sagebrush step, left it to its own devices, the sagebrush step would actually invade the road 
and keep invasive plants they want to get rid of at bay, keep them at a minimal densities to perhaps non-existent. So that's the sort of, uh, you know, my land snorkeling experience and talking to plants and question. Why do you just have them do one mile where they don't do that? <laughs> Nobody wants to do, it, it, it'd be like, I don't know, letting some terrorists go, you know, you got, you got to get them off. <laughs> Otherwise they'll take over. Yeah, an experimental approach would be awesome. But, uh, that's rarely done. Okay, so um, so sagebrush step in good ecological condition. It, it has this resiliency to rebound, like into roadsides or after fire. And also has this resistance to introduce plants that like leafy spurge and spotted napoli, things that we think have this ability to behave like humans and just go in and just set up shop and transform the environment. So um, I guess, the, how do I know what sagebrush step and good ecological condition is? And why do I say, well, it, it's a bunch of forbs, a bunch of grasses and a bunch of shrubs. That's, and probably that's a signature of a good healthy soil microbiome. How do I know that in particular, because maybe 90%, I've driven around the sagebrush step from New Mexico, Arizona, Eastern California, up into Southeast Washington and across over to Montana throughout Southern Idaho. 90% of it has been transformed, not by these annual exotic or annual introduced plants like cheatgrass and others, or in this case, <laughs> crested wheatgrass. This is what, maybe 90% of the, of the sagebrush step looks like it. It lacks forb diversity, it lacks shrub diversity, it lacks native grass diversity. Well, the reason I can, at this point, fairly confidently say I think I know what pristine sagebrush step looks like at both high and low elevations is because of work done at the INL, not necessarily by myself, but by a guy named Jay Anderson, uh, who's unfortunately no longer with us, but who was an ecologist at Idaho State University. And I'll get to his work in just a minute, but the Idaho National Laboratory exists, or it occurs between say Arco, Idaho and Idaho Falls. If you were to take that, uh, that orange area that delineates the INL property, it's roughly 30 miles by 30 miles, so close to 900 square miles. And the interior part of that is sagebrush step in really good ecological condition. I spent three summers there, 2009 through 2011, sporadically after. And uh, what we know about the Idaho National Lab is that it was good human habitat for 13,000 years. And it's also good habitat for a lot of insects. That number 12,000 insect, that's probably a gross underestimate. There's 440 species of vascular plants estimated from that 900 square miles and 211 vertebrate species, which includes 159 bird species. So there's a lot of, it's good habitat worthy of conservation. I don't think people in this room would argue that, but sometimes you do have to argue that with certain people about the value of sagebrush step. And in the heart of the Idaho National Lab, it, the sagebrush step looks like this. There is a diversity of shrubs, and perennial or native grasses, mostly perennial, and grass-like plants. There's also some sedges, like uh, narrow leaf sedge and thread leaf sedge, as well as all the forbs. And there's quite a diversity of it. Now, fortunately, the Idaho National Lab, it's been off limits to, to uh, the public since 1940, when it was first a naval gunnery range. And then by 1950, it was off limits because it was there was uh, weapons research and nuclear energy research being conducted. So this uh, tract of land was just a safety area. Not, and it was, there was no livestock grazing, no human access, very limited four wheel drive activity in here. And fortunately the plants were surveyed every, the plant diversity was surveyed every five years from 19, 1950 to present day. But this ecologist from Idaho State, Jay Anderson, analyzed a data set that included 1950 to 1995. And the upshot of that analysis was that through time, and, and let me back up by saying 
most of the rangeland, including all of southern Idaho from 1850 to about 1940, was highly overgrazed, essentially decimated. There was probably no sagebrush step in good ecological condition prior to 1940. So this tract of land has rebounded from cropland and overgrazed rangeland to its present day status of um, really good sagebrush step. And what Anderson observed was over those 45 years was an increase in cover and diversity of shrubs, subshrubs, graminoids, and forbs. So that was an increase in both cover and diversity. And at the same time, he, re he recorded or detected a decrease and in introduced plant, introduced plant diversity. Okay, so things like cheatgrass became less abundant from 1950 to 1995. And then work he did elsewhere, work that Jay Anderson did near, near, near the campus of Idaho State University out of Pocantillo, he set up experimental plots where he would look at post-fire rehabilitation efforts that included drill seeding. And he found that drill seeding and those sorts of post-fire rehab efforts to reconstitute sagebrush step actually impeded the sagebrush step rebounding because what was going on drill seeding was injuring the underground plant parts, probably messing with the soil microbiome. And he found that sagebrush step in good ecological condition, if it burned, just leave it alone and it'll rebound on its own. So collectively this, uh, Jay Anderson, you could say, was the first one to really point out this resistance and resilience of the sagebrush step. And that's where we uh, took our, in the study. So when I was there in 2009 to 2011, we were at there primarily to look at the INL administrators wanted uh, rare plants and weeds to be censused and have some sort of idea what to do with them. But in addition to that, we uh, did some vegetation surveys to look at all these different burns that were happening in the INL area. So you'll notice that, um, let's see this cursor, I guess I see a cursor, but it's it. So in the center of that uh, photograph, you see a burn and that was 2000 and, oh, Thank you. <laughs> this area right here, this was the 2000 Jefferson, 2010 Jefferson fire. We surveyed that in 2011. This strip right here was a 1996 fire. And then this, this area here is sagebrush step with no evidence of a recent fire. And then of course, this is the good old green stripping, crested wheatgrass green stripping. And all of this you see here, this is looking north at the Lemhi Range, there's Saddle Mountain. So this is all interior INL sagebrush step. And what we found was that among those different burn histories and conversion to wheat, crested wheatgrass, we really didn't find a difference in the plant diversity that occurred. Of the evidence we gathered was if the sagebrush step is in good ecological condition prior to a burn, then post fire, all that diversity will rebound within a year. And what that includes in the Idaho National Lab, that includes the reduction of cheatgrass over the long term, not just the year later, but like 10 years later, 20 years later. Cheatgrass is there. I'm not arguing that, but it's, it's a minimal player in the Idaho National Lab. And you could then ask, well, how is that true of most sagebrush step? And the short answer is, yeah, it is. It's true of most sagebrush step. But you guys live in Bo Boise at low elevation. Think otherwise. And all I ask is don't extrapolate your experience here in the lower Snake River Plain to all the sagebrush step. Okay, so what, now what, um, let's see if I can handle this. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> so what, uh, what we did was we took those plant diversity studies that went through bur different burn histories and proximities to highways and roads of different sorts. And we wanted to test this idea of resistance and resilience that Jay Anderson put forth by looking just at roads that cut through good condition sagebrush step. And what did the what did the plants look like along a road in that kind of setting? And then how do they compare just a little bit away from a sampling site that's not on the road? 
So in other words, what we were doing was we would take a, we'd run a 10 meter wide transect, like not including this two track road, but adjacent to it. So say from here, 10 meters and go one kilometer and that'd give us a hectare. And then some random distance away from the road, we'd run another hectare transect. And we might pair one roadside transect with one or two sagebrush step transects because maybe on one side of the road, it was burned and the other side not. Or in some cases, in, in places outside the Idaho National Lab, you'll have a little sagebrush compared to a mountain big sagebrush habitat. So, so you, we were pairing up sometimes one sagebrush step transect with a roadside transect or sometimes two sagebrush transects. And the reason we did this, it was we were noticing that, you see all this grass right here? This is, uh, for the most part, this bunch grass, this is the introduced bunch grass, perennial bunch grass, crested wheatgrass. And this is the northern, or this is Highway 33 from Mud Lake to Howe is right behind us behind me when I took this photograph. Ecologists in the Idaho National Lab would view this as like that cheatgrass is established there and it's ready to take over. But what we noticed was the cheatgrass, even on a two-track road, would follow the two-track road, but it wouldn't get a foot off the road. Cheatgrass or the... Excuse me, crested wheatgrass, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, so crested wheatgrass would track that would go down the road, but it wouldn't get off the road. It's, and what then in in contrast, plants like Indian paintbrush and some of the perennial cushions areogonum that were out here or buckwheats that were out here, they would make it to the road. What we were seeing was an asymmetry. Sagebrush plants were coming onto the road but things we call invasive, we're not getting off the road. So we wanted to see how general that was by running these transects right alongside roads, then off the roads to see what uh, the diversity in roadside versus sagebrush step transects look like. Okay, so what we have is, this is a map showing the, the location of those one, one hectare transects from the Jarbage Mountains in Elko County, Nevada, here in the south, through the Idaho National Lab area here. This is Craters of the Moon. This is the Big Wood River, which is representative of the Sawtooth Valley Sagebrush Steppe. And incidentally, one dot there would represent a pair, at least a pair of transects, a roadside and a Sagebrush Steppe transect. Here's Manan Buttes. Here's a Grand Teton. Here's the Prior Mountains, Prior Mountain Reserve. And it is a uh, protected area of sagebrush steppe. Here's Lamar Valley right there. Anyway, all these dots represent sagebrush steppe in good ecological condition. It might be embedded in a larger sea of sagebrush, but the site itself had that high diversity of shrub, graminoids, and forbs to indicate uh, good condition sagebrush, okay? And uh, I, a little bit about the results here is of 166 transects distributed from, say, Elko County, Nevada, all the way up to Valley County, Montana. We sampled a total of 657 vascular plant species, 5,500 of which occurred in the sagebrush transects or the sagebrush step transects, 506 which occurred in the uh, roadside. And the numbers are important here, 68 roadside transects and 98 sagebrush step transects. Okay, so that's the, and about 51 species per transect or hectare was the average. So that you could take that as sort of a benchmark. That's an expected vascular plant diversity number for sagebrush step and good ecological condition, about 51 species per hectare. And by the way, on um, the way we uh, sampled the transects, we did one, we did 20 random stops along a hectare to score frequency. That way we'd give equal weight to small annuals versus large shrubs and bunch grasses. Okay, so that's our abundance measure, this frequency. Okay, so let me just start out with this graph. I'm gonna show this, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show graphs and hopefully I'll, inter I'll intersperse them with pictures of plants. But let me explain this first graph to you, and then it should become very familiar. So 
Uh, let's see. So the y-axis is not uh, showing here. Okay. Well, it, okay. The y-axis is a diversity measure. In this case, it's a phylogenetic diversity measure. I guess there's no way to fix that. Is it there? shows on, it shows online actually? Oh, okay. It's just not showing up here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, is it the same as the other graph to the right? There we can read it. So what, what it says here, this is native plant phylogenetic diversity. This is introduced plant phylogenetic diversity. Okay. And there's a bunch of ways to measure diversity of plants in a particular site or along a transect. I'm going to use a phylogenetic measure and you can use abundance or not. And no matter how you do it, the results I'm going to report, they hold true. Okay. But the reason I'm a, a, I'm a, a re pointing out or using a phylogenetic measure. It's just a simple way of saying the number of species, genera, and family families in a transect. It's a composite measure of that kind of diversity instead of just species diversity. Mm -hmm. So you could have two transects with 10 species each, right? But if one transect had 10 species that belonged to two genera of plants, that would be less diverse than another transect that had 10 species, each of which belonged to a different genus and family. That would be greater phylogenetic diversity, even though species richness is the same. So that's the idea behind phylogenetic diversity. And of course, the x-axis is roadside versus sagebrush step. So roadside will always be to the left, sagebrush step to the right. And then these box plots, that thick horizontal line is the median, so the most commonly measured diversity metric for that for, uh, for these 68 transects. And then the box captures 50% of the data points and the whiskers 95% of the data point. And the, the circles are outliers. And then the other thing to explain here, if both these numbers up here are positive, that means the roadside is more diverse significantly than the corresponding uh, sagebrush site. And if both numbers are negative, that means the roadside is significantly less diverse than the core associated sagebrush site. So this is introduced plants and it's not surprising that introduced plants are more diverse on the road, roadside transects than the sagebrush step and that native plants are more diverse in the sagebrush step than in the associated or adjacent roadside. And notice here, there's 96 introduced species total of the 657 that were sampled, which is 14.5%, which is actually, that's a low number of introduced plants. Most state reports, like the state of Idaho, state of Wyoming, Montana, usually it's 20, 25% introduced plants. In this. So this is an indication that if you find, if you're working with good quality sage rest step, you're going to have lower than expected levels of introduced plants like cheatgrass and crested wheatgrass and so on. Okay, so anything else about that? I think so, and the, the thing I wanted to mention was introduced versus native plants. Those are good functional groups because introduced plants, they're here in North America because they rode the wave of human impact, right? They're, they like, they're either intentionally or inadvertently introduced by human activity. So they're very, they love disturbance they, of, the, the, of the kind that humans, can put out there. So they ride the wave of human impact. Whereas native plants, they don't necessarily do that. They may, some do, but, but a lot of native plants go extinct or go get diminished in abundance because of human impact. So these are two functional groups that are maybe worth keeping track of. Okay, so then let's, so what we have is native graminoids here native forbs here. So this over here is native shrubs. So this is native shrub diversity, native graminoid diversity. So this is grasses and grass likes, and then forbs are all the herbaceous plants that are not graminoids. And you can see here that uh, shrub diversity doesn't matter between, that doesn't really change. They're equally diverse between the sagebrush step and the roadside. Same pretty much with the gra native grasses, although I'll point out a couple exceptions or one exception in particular. And so most of the difference is due to native forbs. Native forbs are greatly diminished along a road transect. Even though the road transect is in high native cover, good quality sage rest step, so you'd think it be should be 
diverse, but it's being near a road impacts native diversity in sagebrush step. But there's still a bunch of forbs in the roadside, native forbs on the roadside. Okay, so what I'd like to do is point out, so these are three functional group, groups, shrubs, graminoids, and forbs, okay? What I'd like to do is pull out the native bunch grasses and look at those. And then of these native forbs, pull out the parasitic or partially parasitic plants and some other uh, life forms or functional groups that I think really illustrate what sagebrush and good ecological condition, what, what kind of plants it would harbor, say before European Americans showed up or Europeans. Okay, so let's look at bunch grasses. What I think is one of the most emblematic bunch grasses in the INL region is this uh, salmon wild rye. Me and about two other people in the world care about this grass <laughs> and, and know about it. It's surprising how much, how little is known about this grass. I think it might be endemic to the Lost Rivers and the Lemhis. It's found from throughout and, and it's the most distinct, it's a large, it's this large bunch grass here. It occurs in the sagebrush step, it doesn't get near a road. It almost like if it sees a road, it just like goes the other way. I, you know, it's like that dependent on the good condition sagebrush. And it has these, uh, you see these things, I'm running my cursor up and down a gloom. So you know, I guess I can get really geeky with you guys about botany, but these glooms, these narrow glooms are in the traditional sense of elements that they don't cup the back of this. Here you can see a lemma midrib. So the gloom and the lemma are out of whack. That's classical elements in the traditional sense morphology. But unlike elements, there's only one spikelet at a node. And the, and the leaves and the stems are this soft, hairy, have, are covered with soft hairs. Now, if you're a plant person, and particularly an agristologist, you're just like, wow, that is weird stuff. <laughs> but if you're not an agristologist, it's like whatever. You can... <laughs> but anyway, it's a really cool grass. It's, um, it's, it's a, and it's a wheat grass, and, and native perennial wheat grasses tend not to like roadsides, they're in the sagebrush step. I would say an even more extreme example of lichen sagebrush step and really sort of avoiding the roadside are the, are the needle and thread grasses. So all those grasses that have at one time or another put, been put in the genus Stipa. So Stipa and Acnatherum and Orizopsis and all those sorts of genera. Here is Orizopsis, or I'll call it Stipa bloomeri, bloomer, Needle grass. This is it's common in the sagebrush step of craters of the moon, particularly the upper elevation part of craters of the moon. Not so much down in the lower elevation part. And I took this picture late fall just because the the, full, the grass stands out against the darker background. Anyway, it's a mix of uh, Indian rice grass and Columbia needle grass. It's pretty distinctive. But all these grasses called the tribe stipe. They're, pre they're native perennial bunch grasses. And uh, they've been shown to associate with mycorrhizae. There's probably attached to the microbiome through mycorrhizae. They're, they're often not easy to grow in garden settings. And so here is stipe E bunch grass phylogenetic diversity. There's 10 species total that I've sampled in all those 166 transects. And this one over here is just native bunch grasses in general. And native bunch grasses don't differ too much between the roadside and the sagebrush step transect. But the stipe, except for this green strip transect right here, sagebrush step always harbors a couple species of stipe, if not more. I mean, it's like an inherent part of the, of the environment, of the sagebrush environment. Whereas roadside adjacent, to good condition sagebrush, it may not have stipe, but usually it does, but it may not have it. Whereas sagebrush step, other than this green strip transect is always with stipe, a couple species. Now I put this in the context here, this one here is Agripyron cristatum, so crested wheatgrass. And in this case, it's, we're talking about one species instead of a bunch of species over here. And that one species, I'm just showing the, the abundance in a roadside transect throughout 
from Elko County, Nevada, all the way up to Valley County, Montana. It was common to find crested wheatgrass and roadside adjacent to good conditional sagebrush step. But the most common count of crested wheatgrass in an adjacent sagebrush step transect, see that dark line there is zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's evidence that crested wheatgrass has no ability. It's, it's, it, probably it's due to uh, human cultivation of the, of the cultivars that exist in North America. It behaves like an early successional or cereal species. It has no ability to get in sagebrush step in mature, good quality condition. Okay, stipe, on the other hand, is to me would be emblematic of the sagebrush step. Okay, then I'm, I'm just going to walk through a few of these functional groups now or life forms that I think are diagnostic or hallmarks of good condition sagebrush step. So in addition to stipe bunch grasses, I would say what I call new world legumes. Okay, so new world legumes are include astragalus, that include genera that have been traditionally put in the genus Cerealia, and ge a, a genus that you can find occasionally in the INL Dahlia, Dahlia ornata. So Cerealia are the scurf peas, and Dahlias are the prairie clovers, and Astragalus are the milk vetches. And by New World legumes, the genetic evidence shows that these legumes have been in residence in North America for at least a million, if not four million years. So they've had lots of time to adapt to North American environments, including the sagebrush step. And presumably, I mean, that's a, that might be an explanation for why these kind of legumes are common in good condition sagebrush step. Now, what's not common in good condition sagebrush step are what I'm gonna call the old world legumes. So sweet clover and, and alfalfa things that have been brought over by European Americans, they love disturbance. They don't get out into the sagebrush, but they'll happily track all the two track and pave and gravel roads in a sagebrush step area. But they won't, sweet clover will get out in the sagebrush, but it's greatly diminished in its density and biomass. And then another one are these astragalus that are considered old world, astragalus canadensis. The closest relatives of astragalus canadensis are things that occur in Asia. It got over on its own, probably with advances and retreats of glaciers over the 10, 000, last 10,000 years or so. And so this is another legume that's not common in the sagebrush step. So this right here, this is a the phylogenetic diversity of nitrogen fixers, which would include Commandra pallida and an introduced species, Athesium, equally diverse in roadsides and sagebrush step. The old world legumes like Astragalus canadensis or Canada milk vetch and alfalfa and, and all the clovers, those are equally diverse in the sagebrush step. But what's different is the new world legumes. So the, the Dahlia, the Cerealia, the new world Astragalus. They're those Astragalus species that are most closely related to other North American species. Those are always in the sagebrush step. Again, with the exception of a green strip transect down here. Whereas an adjacent roadside, they may not be present. Okay, so New World legumes are a life form that is emblematic of good condition sagebrush step. And then tuber producers is another one. So the biscuit roots in the genus Lamatium or the onion species in the genus Allium are two representatives of these. You get these in the sagebrush step. And so here is this right. This is the phylogenetic diversity of tuber producing plants like the biscuit roots and the, and the onions. Much greater diversity in the sagebrush step compared to the roadside. And then I took a life form that would be similar to a tuber producing, like the native rhizomatous plants. So native rhizomatous plants would be like western wheatgrass and thick spike wheatgrass and poa, poa arida and yarrow those sorts of things. There's a bunch of rhizomatous native plants in the sagebrush steppe and they're equally diverse in the sagebrush steppe, but the greatest count for those is zero. They're usually absent. So there's something about tuber producers that is different from rhizoma, some of those perennial rhizomatous grasses. The tuber producers have a predilection for 
sagebrush step in good ecological condition. And then I'll get, so let me just, I'm gonna go through a couple more of these and then sort of summarize, but another functional group or life form are the parasitic plants or the partially parasitic plants. So that would include commandra, umbilata, the, the, um, the uh, Indian, uh, what am I trying to say? The paintbrush species, and then this bushy bird's beak and the genus Cordylanthus, and then there's Orthocarpus. So you get the Santalaceae, which is partially parasitic, and you get the Orobanchaceae, which is fully to partially parasitic. And I would say that these are also emblematic of sagebrush steppe in good ecological condition. And the reason for that, here's the para, here's a parasite, parasitic plant. Again, I'm using parasitic to mean partially and fully parasitic. Here, here's everything together. But if you take out the Santalaceae, which is the genus Commander and Thesium, and look at just the Orobanchaceae part of the parasitic plants, the most common count in a roadside transect is zero, but sagebrush step, with the exception again of this green strip transect, has always has a couple species of Orobanchaceae. So I could argue from this that Orobanchaceae is, even though it gets into the roadside, it's still emblematic of good condition sagebrush step. And, up, and then just to mention two more um, life forms that I think are emblematic of the sagebrush step are what I call perennial cespitose forms. Okay, cespitose means bunched or cushion-like or mounded or matted. So like areogonum, there's certain perennial areogonum, areogonums or the buckwheats that form these nice cushions. There's a, here's a areogonum, what, what I call soliceps. I think people from Idaho call it mancum, but I, I'm pretty sure I see one involucra for flowering head. And the uh, southern tip of the Lemhis and the Lost Rivers. So it's pretty distinctive mounded areogonum. Here's a Penstemon pumilus, which is common in the Snake River Plains and the Idaho National Lab area. Beautiful mounded mat forming Penstemon. You know, it only grows this tall in these nice cushion mats. Um, it's some astragalus like calicosis and persia, they're mat mounting and mat forming. Of course, Caryoff lacy has a bunch of mounded and mat forming species like the, what have been species traditionally in the genus Arenaria. Okay, so that's, uh, and incidentally, these, you can't, it's hard to grow these things. Like rock gardeners want to grow these things, but they're often difficult. And probably it could be that the, these things are tied into a soil microbiome or soil crust, a rhizosphere that needs to be accounted for when. And then one last one is succulents, succulents, cactaceae. You find cactaceae and sagebrush stuff and not in the not very much in the roadside. And then what I'll do is show one last um, life form graph here. If you took all those groups, like what I consider emblematic life forms of the sagebrush steppe, so sub shrubs, bunch grass, native bunch grasses, native perennial cespitose forbs, native succulent forbs, tuberous producing forbs, New World legumes, and the parasitic, partially parasitic, and just uh, Orobanchaceae type, and just lump them all together. You can see that they're diverse, more diverse than the sagebrush steppe and then the roadside, but they do make it roadside, they're just less diverse. And in contrast, introduced dicot phylogenetic diversity. This includes 32 non-native or introduced species, like all the species that make the state listed noxious weeds list or the county noxious weed list. So Horiolissum, spotted knapweed, rust skeleton weed, Canada thistle, field bindweed, leafy spurge, halogeton, black henbane, kochia, white top, and both the, both the uh, Dalmatian and the common toad flax, all those, I put them all together. The most common count in the sagebrush step is zero for that class of, whereas adjacent roadside, they're there. You know, there might be a be census a few times in a transect. But so it's showing you that um, sagebrush step, emblematic species of the sagebrush step, like this, group of life forms can make it to the roadside, 
But these things we call noxious weed or weeds or invasive plants, they really don't make it much into the sagebrush steppe. So do roads serve as corridors for invasive plant establishment and spread? The evidence I see is no, they don't. And so the upshot here is that um, if you're managing sagebrush step, it's in good condition. And this, and, and you have a fishing access road here that cuts through that good condition sagebrush step. You don't really have to manage it. Don't spray it. Don't make sure that vehicles don't trample it. And the sagebrush step will take care of itself. In fact, you can see all these forbs and bunch grasses, they're growing right up to the edge of that road. And the only way, only place you'd find cheatgrass is right along the margin of that road. Cheatgrass and, and crested wheatgrass, they don't make it into the sagebrush steppe. So that's, to me, that speaks of what Jay Anderson found of the resiliency of sagebrush to rebound, even against a road like this that's commonly used, and its resistance to any invasive brought in by vehicles traveling these roads just can't successfully establish out in the sagebrush step. It's just they're not, they weren't adapted for it. Okay, so it's it, it might seem a trivial finding here about, well, let's not manage sagebrush step, but it does bolster Jay Anderson's finding that sagebrush step left to its own devices post fire after some sort of disturbance, maybe give it a chance, let it rebound on its own. So I think that's the important message here is trying to underscore Jay Anderson's work. Unfortunately, Jay Anderson died before his time and he wasn't able to get that message across. But I'm sure it probably would have been. Anyway, uh, anyway so let me just summarize with this one slide. What, where I'm taking this work is developing lists. So if you took the 657 species that we census throughout those 166 transects, I feel pretty confident in classifying them into this one here. This is sagebrush, mainly phylogenetic diversity. So the, all those forbs that are found only in the sagebrush and rarely, if at all, in the adjacent roadside, that's this group of 73 native species here, like sego lily and, and allium. All the, the tuber producing monocots, for example, would be in here. Those, those, that's a life form that does not like roadside, but loves sagebrush step in good condition. And then this group here is from that list. Like I can develop this list, like what plants occurred roadside, what sagebrush step, and determine their abundance. And then there's a huge list of plants that kind of like both. They, they can tolerate a little disturbance to the roadside, but they also like the undisturbed sagebrush step. And a classic one there is green rabbit brush, Chrysophamus vasitiflorus. Or another one would be Sandberg's bluegrass. Or another, their whole genus of fleabane. So anything in the genus of Ridgeron. So showy fleabane, shaggy fleabane, all those, they can do really well out in the sagebrush step, but they can also become very prolific of roadside. It's kind of amazing. And then there's this other group here, like uh, curly cup gumweed. They're native plants, but they like it only roadside. They don't get into the sagebrush step. And what's what's interesting is they're never like a path, they're never a weed problem in a human setting. You know, curly cup and cumweed doesn't invade people's pastures or crop fields, at least not to my knowledge. And so that's an interesting group of disturbance loving natives. They like roadside adjacent to sagebrush step, but they're not going to get where humans grow. They, they like disturbance, but not the kind that humans present or something like that. And then, of course, there's this group over here, like leafy spurs that will invade pastures, invade anything that's disturbed and never get into sagebrush step or rarely. And this is the group, I would say this group right here, this is the best candidate for, uh, group for restoration because it can tolerate some disturbance. They include a lot of uh, pollinator friendly species. Um, they have all the attributes of the seed is often available at a cheap price for a lot of these things in this group. So just trying to use these data to identify good candidates for sagebrush restorations. So I'll end it there. Thank you for your time.